<clears throat> this afternoon's message, again, as I mentioned this morning, is just going to be a portion of what we share in the distraction dilemma. So the distraction dilemma, exposing the dangers in music that distract the Christian from his maker. And that's really the bottom line when it comes to music. We need to be very careful that we're not being distracted from God himself, even in Christian music. Unfortunately, many times what's branded as Christian music isn't always Christian music. The devil thinks that we're just naive enough, and unfortunately sometimes we are, if he puts a nine-letter word on something, we're going to go off and we're going to buy it and approve it. But the reality is, just because it has the word Christian on it doesn't mean that it is. And you're going to see that this afternoon, because today we're going to spend a lot of time in the Christian uh, music. And the challenge that we have in this short amount of time that we have together, uh, there's a reason the original music seminar was 12 hours long because you have to build a healthy foundation before you just jump into the, con the Christian contemporary music. Since we don't have that foundation today, I need you just to be able to understand that what I do share is built on a very solid platform. And so with that, we're going to go into what, what I call the, just the music test itself. We're going to go through a music overview, and we are going to test some of these things. In fact, at, in our second meeting, uh, we'll go through a certain portion, we'll take a quick break, and then we'll come back. And, and something that's really going to uh, be uh, special for me is that my son Tyler will uh, sing a song, and interestingly enough, last night, the song that he has been preparing to sing uh, is entitled, I Surrender All. And last night as I was giving my appeal, uh, I don't know who prompted Kirsten other than the Holy Spirit, she played I Surrender All. And then you were just all singing I Surrender All. And he's like, what is it with this song, Dad? That's the only song I'm going to sing. What, what, what? And I said, it's all good. I'm starting to see a theme here. Because aren't we after all talking about I Surrender All? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. So we're going to do a music overview. And hopefully, we'll be able to answer some basic questions for you. Now, understand that I have had the opportunity to share this particular message around the world. And, and when I say I travel around the world, I don't just mean I literally went here or there. I mean, I, God has put us all over this planet in front of all different peoples, all different cultures, white, black, yellow, purple, zebra-striped. We've been everywhere. And the reality is, everybody can say, you know what, <laughs> as much as I don't want to admit it, I think he's right. And so, when I share what I share with you today, I just want you to be asking yourself the question, not do I like what he's saying, but is what he's saying truth? Fair enough? Because I might deliver it in a way that you may not necessarily find palatable, but don't reject the message because of perhaps the faulty messenger. Is that fair enough? Three of you? All right. <laughs> so I have a problem with the rest of you? Oh, no. Now, any presenter will tell you that there is one meeting that is the most difficult to have, and that's the one right after lunch. Do you think what might start happening could relate to our first message this morning and any of the people sitting here? <laughs> Starting to slip into alpha and even deeper? If you see a brother or a sister accidentally slip into the alpha brain, uh, brain pattern, just lovingly kick them, I mean, uh, nudge them back into beta. And for those of you who were not here this morning, um, I cannot give you a full overview, but I'll give you a really quick snippet of what we talked about this morning. The brain functions in many different frequencies and different states. And when we are consuming information, and information is coming in through our five senses, we need to be in and should be in what's called the beta brain state. In other words, the brain is active and is critically, dynamically analyzing all the incoming information. It rejects the things we don't believe, it accepts the things that we believe, and then later it's filed away. And, and that becomes what we call our subconscious or the memory system. 
And so what the devil has learned to do is, and, and by the way, the brain also goes into another state called alpha. And the alpha state is when you're not dynamically, critically analyzing everything that's coming in through your five senses, especially audibly and, and uh, through optically through your eyes. So what happens is you receive all this information and you want to dynamically, critically analyze it, but we can also be in a different state and that's called alpha. And unfortunately, the brain is not processing, the conscious brain is not processing, it literally just accepts it and it's not... Um, it is not analyzed at the time of exposure. So the problem is we could be, if we're in an alpha state, we could be consuming our media or whatever it may be and that could be putting in a lot of information that could convert our souls. And so I've had people come up to me and say, well, what would be wrong if a preacher had everybody go into alpha and just preached him the truth? <laughs> and I thought, for, for a little bit there, I kind of go, well, let me think about that for a second. But the reality is that God wants us to be aware of what truths we're accepting because he wants us to, be, like, to come and to reason together, not to be force-fed his spiritual food, and w whether we like it or not, that's what we accept. So the reality is the devil has figured out how to work and to force the brain into an alpha pattern through different media and other things. And today, of course, we're having a music seminar. Today we're going to look at a couple of important questions that many Christians have asked. And really, the first question we're going to look at and we're going to answer pretty quickly, actually, is, is music moral or amoral? In fact, Brother David, if maybe if you took a little bit of bass out of my voice, we may not get as much distortion, perhaps. Is music moral or amoral? Now that's a good question. Is music moral or is it amoral? In other words, the, is it, if it's moral, that means it could move my character in such a way that I could, for instance, um, be making immoral choices. So therefore, music would be, have a moral component. Or is it amoral, meaning that there's no moral weight to it, it doesn't matter what I listen to because it doesn't help me to make moral or immoral decisions. So the question is, is it moral or amoral? Well, we're going to look at that. We're also going to ask the question, is it the lyrics or is it the music bed that ma matters most? And by the time we're done with this this afternoon, you will be able to very solidly answer that. Is it the lyric, lyrics or the music bed that is most important? Sandy Patty. Now, she's a very popular Christian singer, and uh, she would be in what we would call uh, the CCM genre of music, the contemporary Christian genre of music. And within that larger genre, there are sub-genres or categories of music. She says, music is a very powerful force. Is she right? Yes, we talked about some of that this morning. She is absolutely right. It has a way of breaking down barriers. Is that correct? Yes, it does. Absolutely. It, in fact, friends, it can break down emotional barriers. No, don't read on. Hold on. The, it, music can break down emotional barriers. barriers. It can break, down, you, break you down physiologically, neurologically, and you're going to see that. And it can also break us down spiritually. However, it does have a way of breaking down negative barriers as well. But a lot of artists are taking that very powerful tool and putting negative, horrible lyrics to it. And those lyrics are getting into the hearts of the listeners and are shaping their values. Is she right? Yes, she's absolutely right. She's saying, look, we have a lot of music out here. It's very powerful. It breaks down barriers. And the problem is a lot of people are doing, uh, putting horrible lyrics to it and it's getting into the hearts of the, of the listeners and shaping their values. So this is interesting. Excuse me. The Christian musicians, especially the CCM, that means contemporary Christian musicians or music, are saying, look, the horrible lyrics are getting into people's hearts and shaping their values. However, if we go and talk about maybe the music bed itself has some of those same implications, they don't want to hear it. But we're going to dispel that today. And then she continues, why can't we, i.e. contemporary Christian musicians, take that same powerful force, music, and put positive lyrics to it and begin shaping values that way? So this is really the, the battle cry, if you will, of the CCM movement and the more contemporary music 
movement that we have in the churches, not just ours, but in churches around the world. So what they claim and what they, 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 they really want to say is that really the most important thing is the lyrical content. And so the, they decry, it doesn't matter what, what um, music bed the lyrics sit on, as long as they're good lyrics, then it becomes a good song. David Meese, he uh, used to be quite a popular CCM artist. He says, basically, you have to focus on the lyrics and what the song is saying. That is my criteria to decide whether the song is right or wrong. It has nothing to do with the music style. It has to do with the lyrics. What is the song saying? What are the words saying? As Christians, we can objectively judge it from that standpoint. So this is what, what the, the big argument is, is that It's the lyrical content that's most important. Yet professors and scientists have a different view of this. And Professor uh, Professor, uh, Marshall McLuhan was one of these. He's no longer with us. But his his studies that he had uh, were really, they are viewed as a cornerstone study of media. And he was a professor as well as a scholar. And here's what he says. The medium is the message. That is to say, the music is, Its melody, harmony, and rhythm all by itself disposes a man to virtue or vice by moving the emotions. Therefore, the way in which they move the emotions should serve as a principal basis for judgment on whether any given piece of music is good or bad. So on one side, we have Christians saying it's just the lyrics, and then we have the scientific community and 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 uh, others saying it's more than that because the music itself moves the emotions and it moves the passions. And so, for instance, what they're saying by the statement is, if I listen to music that's filled with hatred and anger and rage, it's going to imbue us with that same hatred and anger and rage. Yet the Christian world, by and large, the musicians don't want to hear that because they just want to put their Christian lyrics on whatever they want, and it doesn't matter what the the music bed is. So we need to continue to look into this. Brain specialist Dr. Richard Pellegrino, he declared that music had the uncanny power to trigger a flood of human emotions. Is that true? Music can trigger a flood of human emotions. And images that have the ability to instantaneously produce very powerful changes in emotional states. And remember we talked earlier about when the way that everything is filed in your brains and like emotions and different things are are interconnected and they're kind of like in a folder together. That's not really an accurate picture, but this is how it works. And, And if there is a stimulation of, say, for instance, the death file, because someone dies or something in your life dials, it tickles that file and like memories are going to be triggered. And so what he's saying here is that depending on the music you're listening to, you can trigger an, an incredible amount of, of emotions and images instantaneously. He continues on and says, take it from a brain guy, in 25 years of working with the brain, I still cannot affect a person's state that, the way that one simple song can. So what's interesting is music has, been, has now been permeating so much of the sciences. In fact, those who are having counseling sessions um, with, with their patients, they will put on certain kinds of music many times to help assist the therapy and to help people to get to a place to where they might be able to break down some of those barriers and get through to some of the core discussion they need to have. In the medical profession, they're also using music to uh, help little preemie babies, for instance. If they can't uptake much oxygen and the little preemies are having these struggles and problems, it's amazing. They can play certain kinds of music and the respiratory rate will go up and the, 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 in, uh, the intake of oxygen will go up sometimes 20 to 30% just by playing certain kinds of music. And so music is now not only permeating every part of our life, it's actually permeating science pretty much everywhere. But what we want to do, I'd like to do with you, is I would like to go ahead and do a little experiment. Can music alone, just a music bed alone, influence the listener? So what I want to do is I want to play a piece of music. I'm hoping that we can discern the music um, through these speaker systems. And I would like you to close your eyes when I play the song. 
and then when we're done, just simply tell me what was going on in your head or in your emotions, okay? So here we go. We're going to play the first song. Are you guys ready with the song? All right, close your eyes. Here we go. Okay, so somebody tell me what went through your mind or through your emotions, if you will, listening to that simple little piece of music. Anybody? Say again. Scurrying around, shopping, jumping around. Okay. Someone over here? He was on a, all, in a country road on a flatbed truck going to town. What lyrics told you all that? You were moving on. Anybody else? Now, how about, how about you, sweetheart? Right here in the front. I was watching you, and you were going. So what was, what was happening in your mind? Like a dance or like a party or something. Everybody's happy. They're having a good time. Okay. Would anybody disagree with those things? No. You see, what's interesting is we just did a little tiny experiment and we played a simple song for seven seconds and in seven short seconds you had images popping into your mind and what kind of emotions by the way those were some of the the images popping in your mind what kind of feeling did that bring for anybody happy you know what i i predicted that you guys would say something today i thought you would probably say that happy and fun now did i predict that or do i just understand music like you do Amen. Now, what lyrics told you to feel happy? The, well, there were no lyrics. So wait a second. Is the music bed itself pushing our thoughts and our emotions and the images in our head? It is, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, good question. I, I, I was going to be getting to that, but I can answer it now. The question is, what, what, what are personal experiences that we've each had, what, uh, how do they influence or color when we're listening to music? Great question. The reality is this. For a majority of all of us, when we play a certain kind of music, most of us will all, not all, most of us will respond in certain ways. For instance, if you're watching a film and, and all of a sudden that ominous, scary music comes in, you're not going, wow, I think something great's going to happen. You know, because we understand the language of music. Now, I'll give you an example to answer your question. A dear sister of mine was, uh, asked me to sing a, her favorite hymn and her mother's favorite hymn at her mother's funeral. The hymn had always brought her comfort. The hymn had absolutely just been a joy in her life. But as I sang it at her mother's funeral, and they were very close one to the other, the hymn no longer was joy to her, and now she attached a negative emotion to it, the death of her mother. And so now her experience had personally colored that particular piece of music. Nothing wrong with the piece of music. There's nothing wrong with the lyrics, there was nothing wrong with the melody, nothing wrong with the way that I sang it. But now she attached that, that hymn with the death of her mother. So now for her to listen to that hymn, even unto this day, nearly 18 years later, it's a stumbling block for her. So yes, our personal experiences can color us. In fact, I can give you an example. For me personally, I was raised in a horrible home. My evil stepfather that used to beat us and do all the stuff if you were here last night you heard the story he would play music all the time on a guitar and he loved the, the music's music of the 70s because he was really a, a product of the 70s and so now when i hear certain 70s pieces of music i'm brought right back to my childhood and my childhood wasn't good now there might not even be anything wrong with that song but it is definitely wrong for me. So, even though we're going to go 
through and give you some criteria and some tools today of how to better discern and choose songs. Even if a song is not inappropriate for everybody else on the planet to listen to, it might be for you because of the way it moves your emotions. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's, let's do another. Go ahead and close your eyes. We're going to listen to another one here. Make sure our volume is up, David. And here we go. What's wrong? Why do you, what are you shaking your head for? She opened her eyes and she's like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. <laughs> Am I wrong? No. What, what was going through your mind? Something's about to happen. Is she right? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Who went, yay! You see, what's interesting, and now, by the way, someone else tell me how they felt or what they saw in their mind. Yes, sir. Trepidation. Trepidation. That means uh, fear of the unknown, right? Anybody else? Yes, in the back. Danger. Tension. Say again. Oh, a scary movie. Yes, okay. Yes. Say that again. What's around the corner that's going to kill me? Yikes. And, and, and I'm so sorry I played that in here. <laughs> But understand, this is for educational purposes, right? So I figured you guys would say the same thing, that it was eerie and it was scary and there's trepidation. Now, let me ask you a question. There's not a lyrical cue here. You are reading, listen, the body language of the music. Did you understand? We're going to get into that in just a minute. But literally, you are discerning by the way in which these random notes and instruments are put together exactly the motive, which is a musical term, the motive behind the music. The motive and the body language of the first song was happy. It was joy. In fact, what's, what's funny is when, when I was putting this together many years ago, my, my youngest son, Micah, he would go, Daddy, Daddy. And I was editing the song together. He goes, Daddy, play the froggy song. And I, I had to rack my brain to think, did I have something named the froggy song? And, and I said, well, what's the froggy song? He goes, you know, when the frogs are jumping through the, the grass and they're, they're just having fun and they go to the pond. And, and I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about, buddy. Because in his mind, ba, ba, da, ba, 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 he totally saw frogs having a great time. And I thought, wow, that's the power of music, right? Here's the last one. Close your eyes. Okay, oops, I just messed up. Uh, go ahead and mute the sound for a moment because <laughs> I have to play through all of those for a moment. So that last song, even though I cut it off, I apologize. Anybody tell me in that 3.2 seconds, what was it starting to tell you? Like a kind of a worship song, okay. Anybody else? Peaceful. You got that in three seconds. That's impressive. You guys are quite educated. The reality is we, by and large, 99% of the time, even though it might even negative emotionally impact me in some way, we can discern what the intent of the song was. And so what's interesting, as scientists went around and they looked at these different uh, cultural groups, they found that it didn't really matter what group they were in around the world, everybody responded neurologically to the music identically. Maybe not emotionally, but neurologically, and many of them, most of them, physi uh, physiologically as well. We'll get into a little bit more of that as we go. What's interesting, oh, here it is right here. <laughs> Dr. Norman M. Weinberger, professor of neurobiology and behavior at UC Irvine in, uh, Research, confirms that 
Music can rapidly and powerfully set moods and do so in a way not easily attained by other means. We just experienced that on a little uh, experiential level, uh, what we'd call a clinical level. It wasn't, we didn't have to do a double-blind study to prove what we, what we just experienced. Literally, we can say, yes, I, I sensed that, I had these pictures, yes, music does this. Robert Palmer, now this is an interesting thing that he says. He says in, in a, a magazine, a book, excuse me, called, uh, entitled A Rock and Roll and Unruly History, Robert Palmer, um, who was, was a rock and roller, he said, I believe in the transformative power of rock and roll. This transformative power adheres not so much in the words of the songs, but in the music itself. What's interesting is you will find in science, in the scientific community, and in the medical community, which is also a scientific community, as well as the music industry by and large, the secular music industry, they will all understand this, that the music bed itself, it's not even the lyrical content as much as it is the music bed. And there's a reason I'm harping on this. It'll become clear as we go along. It, and it says, in the sound and above all, the beat. So the rock and roll industry understands it. So now I want to tie some of these things together. Before you, you guys are going to read ahead. So, let me ask the questions. Were our thoughts being moved by the music, yes or no? Were our, our feelings being moved, yes or no? Okay, so our thoughts and our feelings are being moved. And we're trying to answer the question, is music moral or amoral? Well, let's use the beautiful sword that we have called the spirit of prophecy. If the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. So in other words, I could apply this to my music choices. The, the, listen, the musical thought of the song, if it's wrong, then it's going to impress my feelings and, and my thoughts will be wrong. So let's read this. If the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. Oh, so if I'm hearing that musical thought and that musical feeling, then it's going to be wrong inside of me. And the feelings, the thoughts and feelings combined, don't really matter. Well, that's what most Christian music, musicians will say. It doesn't really matter the thoughts and the feelings. It doesn't really matter. It's only the lyrical part of the song. And they'll say, you know, a lot of bad thoughts are getting into the people because of the lyrical content. Wait a second. Sometimes when you look at a song, the lyrical content is the least impactful. The body, the music bed of it is far more impactful, moving the thoughts and the feelings. Are you with me so far? Okay, so if the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. And the thoughts and feelings combined make up the moral character. Thus, music is expressly moral. It's moving the thoughts and the feelings. And the thoughts and feelings combined make up the moral character. Yes, we better be careful with the music beds we're listening to, my friends. Of course, the lyrical content as well. But we can't say, because I put some Christian lyrics on a hideous music bed, everything's going to be okay. You follow what I'm saying? It's actually a house divided against itself. In fact, think of it this way. My satanic music bed is not sanctified by my Jesus lyrics. Did you catch that? So if I have a satanic music bed, or I have a music bed that lends to anger and rage and rebellion, and I put Jesus lyrics on top of it, the lyrics do not sanctify that inappropriate music bed. It would be akin to, I'm going to put scripture on hundred proof alcohol on that bottle the the scripture on the bottle doesn't sanctify that alcohol or if I had a bottle of wine that that would cause you to be inebriated if you drank it because it's wine that stirs itself aright like the Bible says and and whoever drinks thereof is not wise it's, it's raging and it's it's a mockery right so if I put scripture on that wine bottle it doesn't turn it to good grape juice. You follow what I'm saying? It's the same thing with music. It's the identical thing with music. So I have a question. Is music moral or amoral? You vote. 
Of course it's moral. Amen. You're educated people. So we cannot say it's amoral. It has no moral weight to it. It's just the lyrics that matter. Of course not. That's really a, an ignorant statement. <clears throat> and then she continues on. When we decide that as Christians we are not required to restrain our thoughts and feelings, we are brought under the influence of evil angels and invite their presence and their control. So, yes, we're going to see there are neurological is, uh, um, impacts of music. Yes, there are physiological impacts of music. And friends, there are spiritual impacts on music. There are spiritual impacts on our soul by the music we listen to. We, we just read that. When we decide that as Christians we're not required to restrain our thoughts and feelings. No, 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 no. I can it, listen to whatever I want to, you know, as long as it's Christian. I can listen to whatever I, I can listen to Christian death metal. I can listen to that. I can listen to Christian hip hop and rap. I can listen to I can listen to Christian gangster rap. I can listen to all of that. It doesn't matter. Wait a second. We are told by the servant of God when we decide as Christians we're not required to restrain our thoughts and feelings. So we are brought under the influence of evil angels. Anybody want a devil on your back? No, thank you. There are serious spiritual implications by what we listen to. In fact, we invite their presence and their control. No, thank you. I would love to just create and listen to, and I wish the whole world had to listen to only beautiful, sanctified, God-approved of music. I guarantee you we'd have a lot less problems in this world. So when we listen to music, watch TV shows, movies, surf the internet without restraining our thoughts and feelings, friends, we could be very careful. We need to be very careful because we could be inviting demons to hang out with us and allow them full access to control us. That's what that says. Now you have to ask yourself the question, do you believe that that is true or not? Not whether you like it or not. Lord, is this truth? It's truth, my friends. I do too, 100%. <clears throat> the history, this is from Messages to Young People 291. Quote, the history of the songs of the Bible is full of suggestion as to the uses and benefits of music and song. Rightly employed, that means we could employ it in a wrong way, it is a precious gift of God. Now listen to this. God gives us the gift and he's designed it to uplift the thoughts to high and noble themes, to inspire and elevate the soul. I want this to be the guiding light for me as a Christian. Lord, I only want music that is, uh, it causes my mind to think of high and noble themes and it inspires me and it elevates my soul to heavenly things. That would be a right use of Christian music. If I'm listening to Christian music that puts me in a, in a different trajectory, then we need to question whether or not it is music that God actually approves of. So, some people want to say, oh, Christian, he's just totally against anything that moves your heart and we can't have emotion. Not, God made us with emotions, my friends. So I'm not going to say, God, you made a mistake. Of course not. God made us with emotions. And is it a wrong thing to have a song impress our emotions? No. Can a song move our emotions? Sure. That does, that's not the criteria that we say whether it's appropriate or inappropriate. But we should be asking the question, where is it moving my emotions to? Make sense? Okay, are you guys with me so far? All right, anybody in Alpha? All right. So of course God, did God create music to influence our thoughts and our feelings? Of course he did. You see, I believe that God wants us to experience different music but not violate biblical standards, not violate known information. Satan knows the standards, and he knows how music works. Do you think the devil has left music alone? Absolutely not. That would be the inspiration and that would be the fruit, absolutely. All right, 
Now we're going to do what I would call a very quick musical history. We're going to spend probably 8 to 11 minutes on this, maybe a tiny bit more. In the music series, we spend over two hours doing this to paint a proper picture so you can see the, the beauty in which music began and what I call the devolution of music, the deforming of music. But we're going to do a quick musical history here. We'll start in the Renaissance age from 1450 to 1600. In Europe, there, this was really one of the birthplaces of, of music for us. Uh, music back then was very elevating, ennobling to the soul. Music was created and used all around the world. Now, I'm going to play a sacred clip for you from the Renaissance era. Here we go. I'm sorry, uh, a couple points. Uh, Renaissance simply means rebirth, and many changes took place in the way that music was created. In fact, music before the Renaissance time used to be very, what they would even call simple music. Composers concerned themselves with three areas of music, sacred, secular, and instrumental. Here's a sacred clip, and then we'll listen to a secular clip of Renaissance music. Do we have our audio up? So what would you say the body language of that particular song is? It was very reverent, wasn't it? You see, you understand a lot more about music than you actually realize. You're able to discern what the motive was behind that music. Every musician on the planet that ever has been or ever will be, with every song that we create, we are creating a motive in the music. And you have just discerned that that was a very sacred, reverent piece of music. Now, we're going to play a secular piece of music from that same era. Head bangers bash. How would you characterize or classify the body language of that song? The same, very similar. In fact, that's, that's exactly what we find in some earlier pieces of music. And, and there's a fundamental reason why. When, when these composers were looking to their inspiration, in the pre-modern era, in other words, a while back there, this will get clear as we go, everybody believed in God or the gods or some higher power. And so the reverence and awe with which they approached their music was foremost in their mind. And they would literally, when they created their music, they had the world view of God, the gods, or some sort of higher power. And so they were offering this music really as an offering unto their God or gods. And so their music reflected their awe and the, the sacredness of the time. This is what we would call the pre-modern time, okay? What's interesting is in the, what was called the modern era, which started around the French Revolution time all the way through until about the 1960s and 70s, what's interesting in that modern era, they started to change from this place of we believe in the majesty of a, of a god or a higher power and the, 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 the entire uh, world view literally began to shift in the whole world, especially after the um, origin, uh, let's see, um, Darwin and his theory, his origin of the species came out, and it began to have people starting to think in a different way. It began to influence even the music because if a human being is influenced and has a different world view, then his music will be expressed the same. And so now, there wasn't such mystery and awe and magnificence. Man, we came from, from evolution and, you know, we came from monkeys or whatever it was that they began to start to believe. Interestingly enough, in that modern era, the music began to shift. 
quite rapidly, in fact. Uh, you'll notice in, this, in the Renaissance time, music was very similar in nature, shared smooth, gentle rhythms and melodies with balanced phrases. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to jump from the 1600s in Europe, and we're going to take a massive leap to early America here. Now, the music of America was largely based on that of Europe, since it was Europeans that settled the New World. Do you know why the New World was sought after? Because they wanted to escape from religious persecution. Eventually, the church was persecuting people, and they wanted to come to a place to where they could worship under the dictates of their own conscience. And they moved here to America and began to settle the New World. However, music began to change in the early 1800s in early America. A blight on our nation, the American nation's history in the 1800s um, was when, unfortunately, slaves from Africa were sold to white merchants in North America. Now, I want you to understand, we are going to talk about early American music. And there's a reason we're going to talk about early American music. We're not going to have to do a lot of study into the European music, for instance, um, but we're going to study and look into a little bit of the early American music. And there's a reason for that, because what happened in early America actually made an entire shift in the music world that has lasted up until this day, 2016. In fact, what happened in, in early America influenced the rest of the world because America became a great ex, uh, expositor and exporter of this new music. Now, moving on. So, when the slaves were brought from Africa to America, and they were sold to the merchants in North America, they brought with them from Africa their ritualistic religious practices known as the white man called it voodoo. It wasn't called voodoo in Africa, but that's the label that they put on it, which was heavily wrapped around tribal drumming. And understand that the religious experience of the early Africans, and even up until this day, and I, I was just in Nigeria last year, and I shared uh, this particular same presentation there. When I was talking about these things, they, they were absolutely saying, this is true, my brother. This is so true, my brother. They, they understood the heritage. They understood where this came from. And there are many Christians in these African nations who are standing up against the ancestral worship that they have. A lot of, but here, here's the problem. A lot of African Americans don't know the real history from where they're from. They don't, they don't know that. Unfortunately, they stop just at the point of slavery. They stop there. But they had a very rich, some of them had very deep culture long before that. In fact, I would dare to say I know probably some more about the African culture than some of my African, uh, American African brothers, uh, uh, African American brothers and sisters. And we're going to be talking about that tribal music because it influenced and changed the world. It literally did. Now, I want you to understand that Africa is not the only place where this tribal drumming and this ancestral worship happens. It actually happens around the entire world. Did you know that? It happens everywhere. I'm only going to talk about the African voodoo in a sense, because that's what funneled in and then was deposited out in the world. John H. Steele, he's a, an expert in the occult and also uh, ancestral worship. He says, the follower of voodoo seeks to incorporate a law in them, which is what they call a lesser god, into himself by writhing and leaping through a dance while drums bang out complex rhythms. Now, here's the perspective of many people in the West. They think that this is something in the past. They think that this doesn't happen anymore. Oh, that was way back when. No, 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 no. You can go there today and it still happens. Around the world, in fact, in different cultures. When just the right rhythm is found for an individual law, the dancer takes it up and the law enters his soul. And the, the religion is strictly Dionysian, which means sensual. Now, when... The, the point of in, in this, uh, this worship service is to go to a place where they call the crossroads. 
between the physical and the spiritual, the metaphysical even. And what they want to do is they want to become possessed by the spirits, by their dead spirits, their dead ancestors is what they believe. But we know, of course, when you die, you don't float up to heaven and they're not going to come back and inhabit you. We know they are called what? They would be demons when they are uh, uh, coming into the soul. So they're having this dance, they're dancing around, and what's happening is they're getting themselves into a place of self-hypnosis. They are no longer going to have the reasoning powers like we talked about this morning. They're going to go into an alpha or perhaps even a deeper state than that, and they're going to open themselves up, much like the wrong kinds of meditation will do for you. So now that they're open, they can receive and become possessed. This is how it works, by the, by the way. This is, this is the real deal. Now, what you'll always find in, in pagan uh, rites is you'll find three things. You'll find um, mind-altering drugs, you'll find hypnotic mind-numbing music, and you will find inappropriate sexual relations. Now, if you think about the slogan of the rock and roll industry, it's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's literally the same thing. It's just been repackaged in a different way, and you'll see that as we continue on. The drummers, drummers often shuffle their feet or sway their bodies in dance-like motions to assist them in maintaining contact with the main beat, especially when the rhythm is syncopated. During these rituals that still take place in Congo and the Yoruba, and Yoruba land, the intricate layers of multiple rhythmic drumming are considered to be the primary source of occult power. Now this is very problematic for the Christian. The multiple rhythmic drumming are considered the primary source of occult power. So what they've found is that through this drumming, it puts you in this state and it opens you up for this type of possession. Friends, as a Christian, I don't want any other possession except for to be the possession of Jesus Christ. And I don't say that lightly. That, that's the serious consequence we have here. We need to be very careful with what we're listening to or we could be opening ourselves up to something very satanic. We need to be careful. By the way, they call this uh, the, the beat, that, that really that, that deeper beat, they call it the guiding pulse. I want Jesus Christ to pulse through my veins. Now we're going to listen to some actual multiple layers of rhythmic drumming. I have no idea how that's going to sound on these speakers. I hope you can discern what's happening there. Um, and so when you are, by the way, when you're critically analyzing something and you're listening with intent, you're not just indiscriminately listening, then you're not in danger of becoming hypnotized by it. So when we play these things, you're not, don't worry about that. That's not going to be happening. But I want you to listen to the multiple layers of the rhythmic drumming. And you're going to hear different kinds of instruments. There will be several different ones that we listen to. And you will end up listening to a very modern version of it. And frankly, all of these are very much available. It's not like I went and had to research and find all these things. I just typed in this stuff in, into iTunes, was able to buy everything I wanted to. Absolutely crazy. Because my perception, I'll be honest with you, my perception was at the beginning when I was in my ignorance was that this was something that happened a long time ago. I didn't realize that it's alive and well today. I, I honestly didn't realize. I was like, I was totally stunned when I heard all this. So we're going to start with a simple version and it will go through, listen to the multiple layers. These four or five layers. Here's another. We're going to come back to this one. cut out the other ones. So the whole point is to actually get to a place to where we get in, we become entranced, hip, hypnotized, self-hypnotized or hypnotized by the music and we become possessed with a demon. Now this is exactly how their henpecking order is set up 
in those tribes. In fact, if you go there today, what happens is they will do certain things where they will, they will show supernatural thing manifestations. They can put poisonous frogs in their mouth and not die. They will have snakes bite them and they will not die. They will drink poison and they will not die. And by the end of this, whoever has the greatest um, powers becomes that, that tribe's leader or what we would call the witch doctor, the one that is actually that has the most power. So this is how the, the tribal configuration is set up. <clears throat> now, I'm going to play some samples from around the world so you understand that, and, and, and put it this way, I'm not down on my, my African brother's heritage. That's not what this is about. This is a worldwide phenomenon. Amen? Can I hear an amen? amen. Okay, because I will be painted sometimes by some that I'm a bigot. That is the least thing from who I am. In fact, honestly, I believe that inside of this little white man is a trapped six-foot black man. Because, <laughs> listen, because I don't know why, but like, this music speaks to me. It does. And so I haven't looked at my history, but I guarantee you I'm probably closer to your brother than you realize. So I'm going to play this music, though, and it is... It's from around the world. You'll hear the same type of multiple rhythmic drumming. So it's not an African phenomena, but that is what influenced Western music. Latin America. Same thing. Come on. Doesn't want to switch. There we go. Native America. So even before the new settlers came, this was here in America. All the levels coming in, all the ancestral worship, that's what they have in common. Why? Well, they dispersed from the Tower of Babel. That's why. To every corner of the earth. You can go to Scotland. Russia. Japan. And of course, India. It's everywhere. So it, it's not just localized in one part of the world. And of course, lastly, Africa. Which, to me, to use a term, uh, if I had to listen to any of it, it, that would probably be the one I'd listen to. So the reality is this, this is a worldwide phenomena because we have to know our history even from a biblical perspective and that is that there was a separation of man that happened. All the tribes of the nation, everybody was there around the Tower of Babel. God said, I, every time my people get together, they create a, a, a havoc of living, so I'm going to disperse the, my people around the world and everywhere you go around the world you had two things you had those that believed in the creator God and then you had those who believed in the gods or the gods uh, God or gods or their higher power and there was the pagan rites so there was both if you will the Christians and the non-Christians everywhere you went so that's why we find it all around the world are we clear on that? good alright moving on in the book, uh, The Power of Sound, in a section entitled Stress and Addiction, scientists have also shown that driving drum rhythms in excess of three to four beats per second will put the brain into a state of stress. Now, if you're thinking about, you're, you might be thinking that three to four seconds sound like this. You know, I don't listen to music like that. No, 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 no. Because of the multiple rhythmic layers, you don't have to have one drum going brrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
to help return itself to normal equilibrium. Now, you guys have probably heard of opioids before, right? They are drugs in the medical community that are used for pain, and they're highly addictive. In fact, I, I just heard something that something like 60 million United States people are addicted to opioids because they're on those pain medications and they're on those ones that kind of numb everything. Well, that's exactly what happens in our brain on a chemical level. They don't call it an opioid, but it is an opioid-like hormone because it has the same effect as morphine would on the physical body and on the mind. So when we're listening to this multiple layers of drumming, it causes a stressful state between the two hemispheres of the brain. In fact, science calls it friction between the left and the right hemisphere of the brain. It, it causes this friction between the two, and it, it, it senses that it is under assault. We're being, we're being pummeled by this, and so it creates this stress, and so the brain, the body, because it wants to survive, and this is the way God has programmed us, when you're under assault, he gave us some beautiful mechanism to kick in to help us return back to a normal state of equilibrium, a harmonious state once again. Thank you, Lord, I appreciate that. But the problem is, when we're listening to this multiple drumming all the time, we continue to stress out that brain and release this and release this. And what happens is, we actually become addicted to, like we could morphine or the opioid drugs, we become addicted to the music that's causing that chemical state in the brain. Did you, did you catch that? that? That's actually quite big. That's quite huge. Because people go, yeah, well, come on, you're making a big thing of all this drumming, whatever... I'm just putting all the facts together to paint a picture to where we all go, well, I didn't know that. These opioids, when experienced often enough, can be addicting, and the listener seeks for the high again. This is interesting. This is why the listener tends to move from less to harder music. In fact, it's the same way with people that are on opioids. They start off with a little bit, Oh, it takes the pit, helps maybe, you know, it takes away the pain that they're experiencing. Maybe they had hip surgery or something like that, and they take that pain and they take a little bit of it, and hey, that helps. Do you realize Prince just died because he was, uh, had opioid um, uh, narcotics on him? Didn't have a prescription for it, but he had them on him because of a hip pain from all the dancing for all these years. So he was addicted to the opioids. It can happen with the music. And imagine this. When these rock and rollers and people like Prince are out there doing all this kind of stuff, they're doing their concerts and stuff, they're getting that opioid release, but then when they stop and they're not performing and their pain comes back like, like a crazy thing, they have to take more of these drugs to just get it gone. They're living in a horrific cycle to where they need to start self, they don't need to, but they believe they have to self-medicate. So when we're listening to that multiple drumming, the problem is, the little bit at the beginning, it, 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 we kind of like that. Why do we love, and that's what people, the, the, the people that talk about their music, and I used to as well, they, they refer to it in terms of, I love that band. I, I'm serious, you, you probably said it sometime in your life. I love his whatever, or her song, or what, they love it. Well, it is releasing not only these opioids, but it's actually releasing sexual hormones. So they're having this, this uh, hormonal hit sexually, and they're actually going, I love that music. That's kind of creepy if you think about it. It's a manipulation of our emotions and our hormones. These steady drum, here we go, these steady drum rhythms release in the body gonadotropins, which are sex hormones, which enhances sexual arousal. This is what I'm afraid of for all of our young people. Because some of this music that has all this multiple drumming in it is paint passed off as Christian, well, all of a sudden our young people, they walk around all day long with these white things in their ears. You know what I'm talking about, right? The earbuds. And they're walking around all the time and it's, I guarantee you, it's not dun 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 ba da bum bum It's like, I love the Lord, yeah, yeah, oh, and whatever it may be. And it's doing something to them physiologically, neurologically, and it's, it's releasing these sex hormones. And no wonder they love that music. I want them to love Jesus Christ. 
But you know what? Jesus Christ doesn't manipulate their hormones. Churches do. Can I hear an amen? amen? Seriously, churches do. And as you'll see, what they do is they bring all, all these people into, their, into their, their stages and their auditoriums. They don't even want to call them churches any, anymore. These are meeting places, you know. We, don't, we want to uh, divide, divest ourselves from as much things as we can that, that's church-like, and we want to make it a meeting place where we just come and feel better about ourselves. Well, what we do then is we whip them up with all of this, this multiple rhythmic drumming that causes the emotional uh, hit to where we're like, oh, and we're feeling Jesus in this experience. We, we're not feeling or sensing the Holy Spirit. We're feeling uh, musical manipulation. And then it's releasing all of this, this sexual hormone. No wonder they love going to that church. They're not getting the truth. They're getting a feeling. And so what we're doing is we're bringing in all these people. And friends, it's not just in other denominations. It's in ours as well. I've been there. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've even had to speak on this subject in churches where they're doing this kind of stuff. You want to talk about looks that could kill? I'm worried for our young people because they're listening to this music that's pushed off as this great Christian music and it's releasing all of this stuff and then they're all together. Mom and dad aren't even monitoring their kids anymore and before you know it, these young healthy Christians that started off young and healthy are being moved by the, the trashy lyrics they're hearing in the Christian world and they're being moved by the music bed itself and they start the, the sensual and all the stuff that's happening. Before you know it, they're doing things that they're just modeling in the music. Maybe not the Christian lyrics are saying you should go out and do this with him and her, but the body language of the song is definitely making it very hard to resist when she looks really good. Can anybody understand what I'm talking about? I mean, the implications of this are actually quite deep. In fact, what's crazy to me is I have been called the greatest servant of Satan in the church because I'm talking about these things. I just found out that I was banned from the Sydney conference in Australia. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I was also banned from the Indiana conference. Uh, I suppose we'll keep going until I'm banned everywhere. I don't know. But you know what? Here's the deal. I told you, don't, don't keep asking yourself, do I like the information being presented? Ask the question, Lord, is this true? Amen? Amen. Now, I was banned from the Indiana... I'm not going to get into all of that. But I didn't... I went to Sydney two years ago. I did a month tour all there and spoke all up and down the West Coast. Um, I did... Uh, excuse me, East Coast, the Gold Coast. I, I, I didn't even many times... Talk, I only talked a few times on music here and there even. But the reality was, just last week, a young lady, they had at an Adventist church, it's on, on Facebook, you can go and watch the video, uh, on Facebook, this lady decides to walk up to the front of this big convocation thing that they're having in Sydney at the Adventist church, and the, the, the conference there had invited some uh, musicians from the Pentecostal church to come on Sabbath and to play music. And so what happened was this, this dear soul who came up with the Spirit of Christ in her, I am telling you, she said it way better than I could have. She just walked up and asked for the, for the microphone and said, and basically what she said was, look, this, this music that we've been listening to is not appropriate. It, it comes from voodoo music, and she just went on and said, now, I'm not saying that that would have been the time or place, but the fact that she stood up and she said that, and then when she, they, the conference officials got a furious, they went forward and asked her when, they, when she went to sit down, I mean, that whole room was like, you know, you could hear a pin drop, but she did it really with the Spirit of Christ, and she was saying, we need to learn how to worship God and not have all this manipulation happening. And I'm thinking, oh, what, what a soul, what a strong lady. 
and then she sits down, the conference officials go through the roof, roof, and then they find out, because they question her, where did you hear this kind of information? Oh, from the distraction limb of Christian Berdahl, and now I'm banned in the Sydney conference. It, it, it's not, it doesn't make me sad. It, well, it does, but it's not because they're attacking me. They're attacking a fallen, excuse me, they want to accept a fallen form of worship, and they're attacking what we're trying to espouse, which is true worship of God. And so they're fighting against, I believe, the Spirit of God. And we need to pray for our church, friends. In fact, I believe we are starting into the period of time where it looks like the church is about to fall. Well, it's happening. I mean, it's crazy what's going on. You even just look up what's happening in Los Angeles right now in our church. Lord have mercy. Oh, praise God. Amen to that. And I don't want you to get the impression that I'm the only one that is, that, that's talking on it. So, when composers alter the, the regular rhythms of a song by shifting accents around, they begin to vary the timing of the measures by adding backbeats and breakbeats, and this can happen throughout the entire musical piece. This is where problems can come in, and they usually do. Let me demonstrate a couple things here. These are some different types of music genre. This first particular type of beat is what we would call a conga beat. Then this basic one is a, a basic type of uh, a rock beat. Now you'll notice this particular instrument right here. We'll talk about that. This one right here, we'll talk about that in just a moment. This is more of a medium, kind of a rock or pop beat. This is more of a club or disco type of sound. They're just all hybrids of voodoo. That's all they are. They're just hybrids of that. In fact, what happened, if you look at your history, it, what happened in, um, in New Orleans, where most, not all, but a lot of the slave trade was happening out of New Orleans because it was a trade port, um, and it was, it was a, a, a shipping port there, and a lot of trade was happening. They, they had a gathering place uh, that the slaves would come to, and it was called Congo Square. In fact, you can go there today and still see a plaque memorializing, and there is a square there, and it's Congo Square, and it tells you about the plight of the slaves and every horrible thing that they went through, and this was a meeting place for them. And early on, they would come to this place, and they would play this worship music that we talked about, the voodoo-type music. And the problem with it was, it was not selling in, in a sense. It was, people were like scared by it. And so they, they didn't want, not all people, but a lot of them were scared by this. And they, they saw the, the pagan-esque pagan uh, type side of things. So what happened was over time, they began to clean up the, the edges of it, if you will. And they began to create this new instrument. And over time, the contraption set was developed. We call it a, a drum set or a trap set today. And so what would happen is, instead of having several different people, up to dozens of people playing these different drums, because you could only really play two drums at one time, and usually it was one person playing a certain uh, rhythmic instrument. Well, what happened over time was, they sat one of them down, and before you know it, they were using a bunch of different drums all around them, and they were using all four limbs, and now one person could do what it took before an entire tribe to create. And so now it was put what was called like into a Western form of presentation where the, the uh, ancestral worship and the crossing, uh, like we talked about, the spiritual and the physical, that was now more hidden and now a Western audience could really widely accept this because now it was this really interesting sound. It didn't look so pagan-esque or so ancestral worship-ish. You understand what I'm saying? So now there's this new instrument developed and all of a sudden, a lot of different people start, start listening to and start taking note and going, man, I, I think we could use this. And so during this time, now we're, we're getting into about the 1840s, and many of the free and enslaved Africans started turning to Christ and were allowed to have their own churches. I hate the fact that they were allowed to come unto Christ freely. 
Some turned away from drums completely. Others, unfortunately, incorporated them into their new faith. They would sing the same songs, the same hymns as the Caucasians, but would shouting and beating out counter rhythms on tambourines, gourds, and logs. But I don't want you to think that there was this separation because of the music. Unfortunately, back in the day, there was separation because of something as, as silly as color. And so there was this separation, and so it was very easy to see, okay, that church is doing it like this, okay, that church is doing it like this, I won't go here, I'll go here, and, the, and people would make their choices. But what's interesting is, during these worship services now, the same kind of things that happened in the old voodoo ancestral worship would happen now in the confines of the church. They would sing these songs, beat out all these counter rhythms, and they would speak in these unknown utterances in tongues. They would flip around on the ground because they themselves were becoming possessed, same as the pagan worshipers. In fact, we could call this baptized paganism in the truest sense. Now, I don't believe that these new converts, they were trying to bring demon possession into the church. They just didn't know any different way yet. They just didn't know. So we're not blaming, we're just revealing the truth of the time. <clears throat> and then this guy came on the scene. Oh, before that, eventually this brought about the Holy Flesh Movement. Have you ever heard of this? I, didn't, I hadn't heard of this either, but the Holy Flesh Movement was this whole movement is still alive today down in the South, and it's this Holy Flesh Movement to where you are now holy, you go through this crazy music and it gets faster and faster and faster and faster and guess what they do in the churches you can go and look this up on the internet they'll actually take poisonous snakes and have them bite them but they don't die they drink arsenic and they don't die it's the same stuff but now it's in the church they have holy flesh so they don't die you see no they're possessed with a demon my friends like i said there's spiritual implications with the music that we choose the congregation still sought for possession, only now it was called the Holy Ghost. Do you see something happen in here? I mean, you want to be, I mean, I went to a Pentecostal church. I, I'm not down on my brothers, my Pentecostal brothers and sisters. In fact, they, they played a part in me coming to the Lord eventually. But the point is, when I went in there and I was praying to God to show me truth, when I went into that place and I saw those people flipping around, running around the sanctuary, I was like, what is going on? I mean, I was like, I felt like a fish out of water. Something wasn't right with my spirit. Something wasn't right, my friends. And I want to say, I believe a lot of sincere people are sincerely deceived. Not only in other denominations, but in our own as well. Ay, ay, ay. And then this guy comes onto the scene. Anybody heard of Aleister Crowley before? Now, Aleister Crowley, um, he claims that there was an author of this book that he was given. Came, uh, he claimed the name was, this entity was Iwas, uh, whom later he referred to as his higher self or his personal holy guardian angel. Well, I can guarantee you, if you look into the life of this, this sat Satanist, he was being led by none other than Satan himself. In fact, uh, Alistair was very excited that Satan was le leading him. His mother, by the way, his mother called him the beast. He was raised in a Christian home, and he left the Christian faith and became a dyed-in-the-wool Satanist. His mother called him the beast, and there was an article written about him calling him the most evil man that has ever lived. And if you look at his book here, you can see that there's an upside down cross. Here it is, right? I mean, excuse me, a, a star. And you'll see the horns of a goat here and the ears and the chin. And uh, he has it superimposed over his own face because he himself thought he was the iteration of Satan. He founded the religious philosophy of Thelema. Now, why am I talking about this in a music seminar? It'll be clear in a moment. And he wrote the book of the law. In fact, in this book, it states, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Do you see a problem with that statement? Do whatever you want to do, that's the law. Well, what if what I want to do is immoral? That's the law. 
What if I want that man's wife? If she gives you the mating call, he says, then you may have her. It's disgusting the stuff that this man taught. In fact, I, I'm not even going to go into what this man taught because uh, I think we would run away with itching ears. It's disgusting. And so he also taught, though, that you could become a genius in music. Interesting that the, this man who was being led by the devil would be telling people you could become a genius in music if you practice my Satanism. So the devil knows the power of music. And I believe he's the inspiration for a lot of the junk in the world today. In fact, here's some, he desired to bring on the new age. In fact, the dawning of the age of Aquarius, there's a whole lot of hidden meaning behind all of that we don't have time to get into. And this is a very interesting quote. He desired to, quote, use an army of youth to doctrinate with do what thou wilt. Well, God talks about an army of youth rightly trained to serve him. Well, guess what, friends? The devil wants an army of youth trained in his ways as well. Because think about this, the army of youth eventually become parents that have other children and those parents start to train up those youth and before you know it, you have generation after generation who are seeking to please self, which by the way, that's the essence of the satanic philosophy. You see, a lot of people think that the satanic philosophy is, uh, and, and the satanic, and Satanists, the satanic way of life, is that you go and you have all of these seances and you, you give all these blood sacrifices. Now, there is that. There is that, but not all the time, you see. What happens is the higher levels of Satanism, my friends, is actually a philosophy by which you accept that really you're on this earth to please self. Isn't that the essence of Satan's fall? Pride. You look at the word pride, right in the middle of pride is a big fat capital I. You look at sin, you have the big fat capital I as well. And so really, Satanism isn't this, you know, pitchfork and, and horns and all this goth crazy looking stuff. There is that visual aspect of it. But friends, it's more a philosophy and a way of life that the true Satanist is embracing and unfortunately, that philosophy is permeating the church today. As soon as you tell somebody that they shouldn't be doing something or something else, what are we doing? We are judging them now. No, we're simply educating. No, you're judging. No, you might feel judged in your own soul because the Holy Spirit is convicting you, but I'm not here to judge anybody. We're here to share light, amen? So we have to be careful if all of a sudden we feel judged and all self starts to rise up and all the stuff starts to happen. Let's not be afraid of that, but rather say, okay, Lord, something in me is, is fighting against this. Am I being led by the, the philosophy, the spirit of a satanic thought process? Especially if God's truth is being revealed, right? So if we rise up against anything that God says, we can automatically know that it's not God that's causing us to rise up against it. It is self. And that's the essence of the opposite of being God-like. Because God is selfless. Now what's interesting is all of this music began to be created down in the south largely. And, and down there in the, the epi, epicenter was New Orleans. And we're not even going to get into all the New Orleans stuff because there's a lot of stuff that happens in that city to this day that is purely 100% satanic. It's unbelievable. And people from around the world go to Mardi Gras and do all the stuff. They don't even understand the, the roots of this. Bill Haley in the comments, very interesting. What they start to see, they were really one of the first rock and roll bands and they wanted this, well, not even call it a rock and roll band when they started. They didn't even know what to call themselves. But what they found was this, this new kind of rhythmic music over here. And they thought, what if we kind of clean it up a little bit, quote unquote, and take off some of the rough edges and let's just put together some music that's really based on these amazing, incredible rhythms that make people just kind of go, ah, okay? So they start to introduce this new music along with other groups. What's interesting is, anybody ever heard of the name Louis Torres in our church? Pastor Louis Torres, who is the president of uh, 
the, I can't remember the name of the conference that he's a, now the conference president of. He's down in part of Guam and in the, the islands all down in there. Pastor Louie, before he was a pastor, was the bass player for Bill Haley. He's in our church. In fact, he invited me to Guam to talk about all this stuff because he know that I went down there and he said, Christian, preach it tra- straight because he understands he used to be in the industry. He was at the birth of it and he knew something wasn't right and eventually he heard the call of God and he gave his heart to Christ. Amen. And he is a God-fearing, uh, amazing man. We spent many hours together. Now, what's interesting is this music didn't have this kind of on, ominous feel to it at the beginning. It was very much almost like this happier kind of break free because it had a different kind of body language to it. In fact, I'm going to play this piece for you, and I'm sure even our young people have heard this somewhere in this world before. Interesting, though, it has all the same multi-drumming, multi-rhythmic elements all throughout it, but people started losing their minds when they heard this new music. In 1954, they began writing hit songs, and what they did was they, as a, quote, white band, using what they would call back then black-derived forms, they ventured into this newfound rock and roll. Music, please. And this continued, by the way, into the 60s and 70s. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, A new o'clock, rhythmic rock, instrument rock. involved. Clock, Rhythm tonight, guitar. Five, five, so join me home. We'll have some fun when the clock strikes one. We're gonna rock around the clock tonight. We're gonna rock, 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 till the broad daylight. We're gonna rock, we're gonna rock, go around. All the different layers tonight. in a different presentation. When the clock strikes two. Now what's interesting is that entire song is rhythm. Now, is there anything wrong with rhythm? No, no. You take rhythm out of the song, you've taken, you've taken the life out of the song, quite literally. It is like the pulse of the song. So we're not against rhythm at all, but we have a problem with different multiple layers of drumming that start to release all the stuff and make all the things happen that we've already talked about, okay? So now, it doesn't matter what hybrid of that multiple rhythmic drumming that we have. It doesn't matter what hybrid it is. It's all the same thing problematically. So this new sound starts to take off in, think about this, really very conservative Christian America. And it starts to spread through and for the first time in a very noticeable way, it starts to pit the youth against the parents. Because now the parents are going, this music is not acceptable. And this is because they start to see, listen, this manifestation of inappropriate responses to the music in their young people. They didn't understand the gonadotropins. They didn't understand the release of the opioids. They didn't understand scientifically what was going on. But they saw the different difference in their children. Do you need to understand all of that to say no to a young person? You don't have to understand all of that. If we see a shift in their behavior, something is up. Amen? Well, that's what started to happen. There became this new migratory path away from parental control, away from the church. And this started to create a massive gulf between the youth and the parents. There became a very large gulf between the two generations. What's interesting is even though this music was funner and happier, it released all the same things that this Western culture hadn't experienced before. Some other cultures, they had been releasing this stuff for a long time. And they became more deadened to it, if you will. But like we talked before, when you take that first hit of that drug or whatever, you really get a massive hit. And eventually it goes down, 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 down. So some cultures in the world, they needed more and more and more just to sort of kind of get there. They say the first high is the best and you'll never ever achieve it again. And that's what the drug addict seeks for, is to get that first tie again. Well, this new nation, this new American music was hitting our nation like never before. And all this stuff like that drug addicts hit in the first hit were like, ah! And that's the reality. If you know your musical history or even American history, and you look back in the 50s, the first thing that comes to mind is rock and roll. First thing that comes to mind. Don't even think hardly of anything else, really. What was the 50s about? Rock and roll. 
because that's when the revolution began. Now understand, it was built upon a lot of music for a long time that goes all the way back to the early 1800s. So it's not like it just popped on the map. There were certain cultures and certain area, geographic areas where it had been there for a long time. But now it got westernized in a sense and now it could be exported to a much larger world audience. 50s, 60s, and 70s, when music really had become altogether different than what God had intended. Remember we read, God has given us the gift of music and he intended it to elevate and ennoble the soul, to guide the mind to higher themes, amen? But by the time you hit the 50s, music is being used for almost anything but that. And this Aleister Crowley's, and we don't have time to get into it, if you wanna watch all of that and hear, really see the bigger history with different people like Robinson and all those that were involved in early jazz, we talk about all of that. But the reality is this, that this do what thou wilt philosophy that Aleister Crowley introduced early on in the mid 1800s was starting to really flourish and manifest itself by the time we hit the 50s. And now it was, don't you dare tell us what to do, we're gonna do whatever we want. <clears throat> in fact, this do what thou wilt philosophy, the youth became emboldened with it and they started saying things, and not, not like rebellion wasn't there before, you know, I mean, think about it, Cain and Abel, I mean, rebellion started at the beginning, but the reality was it was being released in a way like we hadn't seen before. They said, you know, we'll decide what goes on, what we do, what we smoke, and imagine this, when I say about, when I'm talking about these things, think about the 50s, 60s, and 70s, a 30-year period that changed the world. We'll decide what we smoke, we decide what we listen to, we will decide how we dress, we will decide how we talk, we will decide how we act, where we go, and do what thou wilt became do your own thing. Every single generation you can go back and you will find from the 50s onward, you will find a satanic slogan and, you, and you're gonna think I'm a little crazy when I say this, but it is the do what thou wilt philosophy just repackaged every generation, every generation. In fact, you're asking, well, what is it this, this generation? YOLO, you only live once. In other words, do everything that you wanna do. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, you do it, because you only live once. What was it just in the 80s and 90s? Can you think of it? Live and let live. Every single generation, in fact, what is it in the church right now? Don't judge me. It's everywhere, my friends. It's the satanic philosophy. We do not want to come into obedience under Christ. And so it's a spirit of rebellion. And, and if you think, if you start with a little bit of rebellion, do you think you're going to get better or worse? you're only gonna go on a trajectory of becoming more and more rebellious. So I'm gonna play a song here that'll probably make the hair stand up on your head even if you don't have hair on your head. So I want you to think about this. We usually take a two or three hour period to talk about the history of music. We start all the way back with early music and you start to hear this, the changing of it where before in the pre-modern era, everybody thought of God and, or the gods and so their music was uplifting and sanctifying and ennobling because they were like, I don't wanna upset God or the gods because they'll wipe us out if we don't do this right, okay? And, or we just wanna bring honor and glory unto God because I'm a Christian and I love him. And then you get into the, the modern era that went from about the French Revolution up until about the 70s here. And in that modern era, it was no longer that we thought about God and all this beautiful majesty. No, the origin of the species started coming out. People started believing in evolution. And before you know it, we were coming from, from monkeys. Friends, if you believe you come from little mollusks and monkeys and apes or what have you, then you can begin to act like an animal. You follow what I'm saying? No, I came from a loving, majestic, paternal father. And when you have that worldview, your music will even reflect that. But all of a sudden, when you start to think that we're just animalistic and we came from these animals, we're just the higher level on the animal, the, on the whole food chain, then before you know it, you can act that way. And guess what? Your music reflects that. 
In fact, during this era, what's called, was called the modern age, this age of experimentation, no longer did you believe that revelation came from God or the gods. You believed in scientific theory and scientific proof, and so you could prove and find truth through experimentation. So now there is no uh, uh, God giving you the truth. It's now we, f- we discover it because we're intelligent beings. Well, guess what? From the 1970s to now, we're living in the postmodern era. And our music is reflecting it. In fact, our society is reflecting it. What's the postmodern era? There is no inspiration. There is no experimentation to find truth. There is no inspiration for truth. Now we're in the postmodern era, and now truth is simply what we define it to be. Do you see a problem with this, Christians? Do you see a problem with this? As a Christian, I believe truth is given by inspiration of God. Amen. It's, and it's not left up to me to decide whether it's truth or not. Uh, it's, it's, up to decide, it's up to me to decide whether I accept the truth or not, really. But now, your truth is your truth. And your truth is your truth. And who are you to judge me? Because your truth is your truth, mine is mine. You see how dangerous this is? Guess what it is? It's purely a satanic philosophy. (laughs) It really is. And so if you go, well, your truth is yours and my truth is mine, understand you've adopted a satanic philosophy because do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. In other words, you do what you want to do, I'll do what I want to do. No, God says you do this and you don't do this. But now you're talking about works. You better believe I am. But we're not under law. You better believe that's true. When I am under Christ... The moment I step outside of Christ, the moment he's no longer living in me, guess what? I'm condemned by the law. You follow what I'm saying? There's no salvation under my soul. But the moment I accept Christ as my Savior, the moment that I, I pledge his, uh, uh, believe in his sacrifice on, on Calvary, he, he applies his blood to me. And in that moment, because I've come to him and now he's working through me, I'm going to have different choices to make in my life. You see, revealing the will of God, that's the work, which leads to obedience because God is obedient even to his own law. You follow what I'm saying? But when we talk about obedience in anything today, all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're this legalist. That's not true, my friends. When we talk about obedience, we're talking about the Christian walk. But you see what the devil's done? He's twisted it. And so by and large, the largest, the church out there by and large believes if you talk about the law, that you're actually against Jesus and his love. Wait a minute. Jesus himself was obedient to his law even unto death because he loved us. So by his love freeing us, spiritually speaking and and eternally speaking, that means now it frees us from the law. So now that he kept the law for us, I can go and become a devil? That is what you call a satanic philosophy. Okay, now, we started with this music. It started off beautiful. Even the secular and the sacred was beautiful, and it was because of the worldview. It started to get changed, and I call it the devolution began. The devolution began, and the music started to come down. Before you know it, it's, it the, the drumming starts to impact everything. The lyrics and stuff, everything before was about God or the gods, and the lyrical content was gorgeous, and now it starts to shift to the point to where we get into the 60s and 70s, and now we can be open Satanists in the world with our music that talks about glorifying Satan and killing Jesus and boasting about it, And it's played on the airwaves around the world as the latest, greatest kind of music. Who do you think's behind that? The devil himself. In fact, what you'll find if you go through and and look into the lives of many of these amazing, massive groups and bands in the world, many of them are self-proclaimed Satanists. I'm not saying that. They say it. And what's sad to me is I listened to all of this music. Before I found the Lord, I am telling you, I, 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 here's what's kind of funny. 
I listened to all this music, but I couldn't tell you a lot of the lyrical content. I could tell you the melody and the rhythms and the drum beats and all that kind of stuff. I could even play some of it for you. But I, I couldn't tell you what all the lyrics were. But friends, knowing what we learned this morning, everything that we have listened to, even the lyrical content, even if my conscious mind isn't understanding it, it's gone in here and it converted me away from God and it made me an enemy of Christ. I want you to look at this song, look at the lyrics, and I'm, understand, I am not playing this to glorify the devil. I am playing this to open your eyes because here's what I did, and my wife and I did when we put, started putting this together. We sent out in social media and we said, hey, Seventh-day Adventist people, tell us what kind of music you like and what you're listening to. Every single piece of music outside of the voodoo clips we listened to earlier and everything we're going to listen to this afternoon, every single one of them was recommended to me by a Seventh-day Adventist of what they listened to, including this song. Listen to how it starts, by the way. You tell me what this is. Can we have some volume, please? Sorry about the speaker system. It's pure voodoo. devolution of music to a place to where hardly anybody objects to it anymore how many people have you heard of people rising up against music today I mean seriously he released that song oh, that's terrible no you had heard you heard it earlier on in in the 50s and 60s and 70s and even in the 80s people would come up when the explicit lyrics started coming out in the 80s and in the end of 70s there were groups that would rise up against it now you never hardly ever hear anybody saying anything about music now because now it's just everywhere and you know what what breaks my heart personally is when i was putting the seminar together with my wife and I was driving, a, I was in a rental car and I was down in, I think, Tennessee somewhere and during the putting together of the music seminar, I would audit different Christian radio stations and, and different secular stations to try to think, you know, how could I illustrate this point or how could I illustrate that? And as I was going along, I don't know what station I was on, all of a sudden, this song came on, and I went, oh, I, this is the Stones. Oh, man, because I used to listen to them. And as that music started, I went, that's pure voodoo. I mean, like, in its purest form, just everything there. You could literally take that and go, here, listen to it over there. I mean, it, it was in its purest form. And then, as I heard the lyrics come in, for the first time because I believe God was giving me spiritual discernment, for the first time, I heard the meaning of this lyrics and I actually began to weep. I pulled over on the side of the road because I was weeping so hard that I used to play this song and I used to love this song and I used to share this song with my friends. I didn't understand what it meant by Pilate washing his hands and sealing his fate and all that kind of stuff. I didn't know. All I know was, that be my name. Ah, you know, I'm just like, yeah, man, rocking out. I had no idea this was a slap in Jesus' face. But you have to understand, I wasn't a spiritually discerning Jew yet. I was a worldly person. But friends, there are Christians today that will listen to this music. It's true. My children don't listen to this music. Are you sure? Are you really sure? A couple more slides. We'll take a quick break. By the way, I hope you guessed my name. Who was his name serenading? Satan himself. 
Su Ching says, for managing people's manners and customs, there's nothing better than music. Very interesting. And then Anton LaVey picks up Crowley's torch. And he actually establishes the official Church of Satan. And what's interesting is he, when he wrote the Satanic Bible, he went back to Crowley's work and do what thou wilt is the whole of the law is the Church of Satan's official philosophy and doctrine. And so what we have to be careful of, my friends, is that we need to not, we have to be aware that many people are out there trying to push their satanic philosophies on us. They're trying to dupe us, they're trying to trip us up. And this is a very telling statement when you think about the founder of the Church of Satan saying, let's get them to a place where they forget their logic. What brain state is that? Alpha. Alpha. We talked about that this morning. And they just do what thou wilt. You see, when we give over our mind, when we, when we lay the majesty of heaven down or we lay that prefrontal cortex, that, that frontal lobe down, when we're listening to this multiple rhythmic drumming, that's exactly what happens. It impacts the frontal lobe because it's hypnotic in nature. And before you know it, we're accepting whatever's coming in. That's why I would, people can sit there, and I was one of them. I would sit there for hours and hours and hours just in my room going like this, listening to music. I was zoned out just being fed all this inappropriate type of philosophy and, and all other kinds of things when the explicit lyrics came out. So LaVey understands we can get them to a place where they forget their logic and just do what they want to do. And that's what we're suffering under today. <clears throat> this will be one of our last examples. Like I said, then we'll take a quick break. This was a, a, a reporter, Jason Sneed, wrote about the huge club and DJ scene in an article he entitled The High, High Tech and the Low Frequencies. <clears throat> DJ Lauren, he writes, AKA Bass Nectar, represents the wave of DJ success, playing amazing sets to dance floors throughout North America and beyond. Bass Nectar's shows have the future primitive feel. That's interesting. In other words, it has this techno feel, but it's really from a primitive source. It has a, a future primitive feel of all-out revelry resulting in the tribal unity of audience involvement. So what I want to do is I want to play a clip for you. You heard this clip before. This was the voodoo clip that we heard. Well, before that, in the 1980s, music became more sexual and in their content, and the, uh, the uh, phrase of the day was live and let live. And then, of course, in the 1990s, the music became more explicit content. And today, we have YOLO and other iterations of that. This is the original voodoo we listened to. Listen. Okay. So now, what we're going to do is I'm going to play one of Bass Nectar's clips now. Now, what's interesting, you, I don't know if you discerned it or not, but the two clips I just played, the actual voodoo clip and that of Bass Nectar's more dance club electronic music, they're actually the same thing. And this is where we need to start tuning our ears to say, okay, what am I listening to? And after the break, which will be just a short one, we're now going to dive into Christian contemporary music. We've listened to enough of the, of, uh, the obviously secular things, but I needed you to have a, a hearing of some of it so then you can discern later are we listening to the same thing and just branding it Christian? So now I'm going to play a clip for you because God impressed me as I was putting this together. Lord, how do I illustrate that this new techno music is the same thing as the old paganistic ancestral worship music? How do I illustrate that? And, and literally right then I got this idea of on one track in this software I use called Pro Tools, uh, put in one track of that music, and then just bring in over the top of it the voodoo music. What astonished me was not only was it the same, I hadn't perceived they were actually in time with one another. So I'm gonna, I'll play the clip. It'll start off with the, the uh, dance music, and when I point, you'll hear 
the actual voodoo music come in over it. <clears throat> Does that illustrate the point that it's the same? It is. And so what would happen way back then and even today in different parts of the world as we play this music to get to a place to where we open ourselves up for demon possession, we become the strongest and most amazing, we get the position within the tribe. Well, what happens today is the exact same thing. No, we don't get the position in the tribe and all that, but we open ourselves up and we read early from the spirit of prophecy that when we think it doesn't matter what we listen to, we can be opening ourselves up to spirit infestation, <laughs> spirit possession, that's the word I'm looking for, spirit possession and their control. I didn't say that. The spirit of prophecy said that. It's just we're showing it in a modern context right now. I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy named Marilyn Manson. He's just one example of, of Satanism out in the youth's lives and they think that this is just cool because they're on the fringe of what's acceptable in the world even in the music industry even these guys are considered really on the edge of what's acceptable in music now I don't want you to misunderstand he's not just a rock and roller he's an honorary uh, priest in the church of Satan in fact, he himself spent much time with Anton LaVey in the church there in San Francisco. They have a, a house that they turned into church and they painted the whole thing black. Here's what he says. Back in 96, by the way, before it got really bad, I don't know if anyone has really understood what we are trying to do to lure people in. Once we've got them, we can give them our message. This is a revelation to many Christians. We are not the only evangelists on the planet. The devil has evangelists on the planet, my friends. And I'm going to tell you, they are well funded. They are much more funded many times, most of the time, than even Christian missionaries on this planet. It's a shame because the disciples of these people are coming and they bow down and worship them, literally will worship them. And they pass around, uh, I'm not going to get into all this. It, it's just too disgusting. There's too many young ears here. The reality is this that these people are evangelists for Satan and they love being the evangelists and they are funded by Satan and they are funded by the people. They have massive evangelistic outreaches. They're called concerts. What breaks my heart, my friends, is we've discovered in the Christian music industry, many of these Christians got their inspiration from the secular bands. And when the youth come to their concerts, they, throw, they have shout-outs to these secular bands and they play their demonic music in the Christian concerts. And then the young people are going, who is that group? Who did he say it was? Oh, wow. Download all their music and now the Christian concert led them to satanic music. This is what's happening. It's a major problem, my friends. And it breaks my heart, I'm sure, and I know it breaks God's heart. So... Here's another statement that maybe will, will lovingly slap us up aside the head. Hopefully I'll be remembered as the person who brought a, an end to Christianity. You see, they want to end Christianity. If somebody kills themselves, this, these are all quotes from him, if somebody kills themselves it's because, of our, because of our music, then that's one less stupid person in the world. And understand, this statement came out shortly after Columbine because there's strong evidence that, well, there is, it's not strong evidence, it is evidence by the police, and they uncovered that these, those two young men that went in there in Columbine and shot down all those people, they themselves were listening and jacked up on satanic music, and they actually acted out what was in the lyrics of the song. Don't you tell me music can't convert the soul. It can convert it to the devil, or by God's grace, with the Holy Spirit. By the way, no Christian music has ever converted one person. I'm a Christian musician. You almost think I'm slapping myself. Not one Christian song has ever converted a Christian, never converted a worldly person into a Christian. Never happened. Not one sermon has ever even led someone to Christ. 
It's always been the Holy Spirit working through them. Amen. Now here, this begs the question. If, if God is not in agreement with the methodologies that we're using to reach people, can he bless it? I, you're afraid to say yes or no. Let me just say this again, and I would like you guys to, to be with me here and show me that you are still at least a little bit in beta. If God doesn't agree with the methodology that we are using to reach people and perhaps even bringing in the methods of Satan, can God bless that way that we're using? Of course not. Of course not. But please, just because he doesn't put his blessing on it, it doesn't mean that God can't work through even our, our way that we're doing it wrong. For instance, my friend Danny Vieira was actually face down in a gutter after he wrecked his Corvette and he was high on alcohol when the Holy Spirit got through to him. But wait a minute, I thought you said that alcohol, Christian, actually caused the prefrontal cortex not to function. That's right, that's exactly right. But you see, God is stronger than the alcohol. Amen? Amen? Now, just because my brother Danny was led to the Lord in that moment and he decided I need to get right with God and he was drunk and he had been stoned as well and he wrecked his car, that's why he wrecked his car, God got through all of that. Why would we make it that much more difficult for the Holy Spirit to work when we bring in all this garbage that he has to weigh, work through just to get to the soul, if you will? You, do you follow what I just said? So the reality is, let's do it God's way so he can fully bless it. Amen. Yeah! Let's have worship services that actually start to worship God again and not the people up here doing this or, or the preacher doing this and everybody's like, oh, pastor, yeah, pa you know, or whatever. You follow what I'm saying? We need to be careful that our worship is theocentric, which means God-centered, not egocentric, which is self-centered, which, by the way, is a satanic philosophy. So if we're not careful, in our worship services, we could be serving the flesh, if you will, serving the person in a way that aggrandizes self instead of minimizes self and aggrandizes God. I hope that made sense. Amen. And one of his last statements, raise your kids better or I'll be raising them for you. Is that true? The average parent spends on average something like 11 minutes a day with their child in America. 11 minutes. Yet, they're plugged in almost the rest of the day. Did you know that on average, young people are listening between uh, the equivalent of a full-time job of music every day, eight to ten hours of music a day. Who has their hearts, friends? Who has their ears? It's not the parents. Definitely not the church. Definitely not the pastor because you only get the pastor for maybe a 20-minute sermon now on Sabbath. That's a in their, in their week. So raise your kids better or your iP their iPods or their iPhones will be raising them for you. And they're not going to raise them to be sons and daughters of God. Christian, you're just being dramatic. My children don't listen to that kind of music. Friends, remember, I talk to your young people all the time, around the world, across, back and forth, up and down in this country. And they seem to tell Uncle Krishna a lot more than they tell you. It's true. Because they're afraid to come to mom and dad and have them fly off the handle that their good little Christian person is listening to overtly satanic music. You see, what I want to invoke across the entire world is a little white flag that says, Mom and dad, I need to talk to you, but I really need you to hear me and don't go off on me. Because if they're reaching out, that means that they want to come away from it. Amen? Amen? But the problem is we get so wrapped up in, oh, my little child, and now we're going to look bad and blah, blah, blah. Come on, who cares about all that? What we need to care about is the soul of our children. 
And it's not just our kids, friends, that are having this problem. The adults come to me and say, I can't get off of this. I've been listening to this, and I, I, I found Christ years and years ago. Or when they first came to him, they did away with it, but then it came back in, and they don't know how they got back on this slippery slope. They secretly cherish it while they're rocking out in their cars, and their wife doesn't even know about it, or their, their spouse doesn't even know about it. I don't think I'm making too big of a deal of it, because when I look at 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do. And, and under whatsoever you do, would that include what we listen to and what we watch? Yes. So here's what God says. Whatever you're going to do, even in your eating, even in your drinking, even in your music choices, even in your media choices, do everything, do all. What, what word is that right there? It, whatever you do, eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do some to the glory of God. But friends, the way we're living, you would think that's how it was written. Right? I know this is hard stuff to swallow. I know I get frustrated and angry for the Lord because of what's happening in the church, what's happening in our homes. It breaks my heart. It's kind of like I'm kind of turning over some tables today going, come on, let's wake up, amen? Amen. Maybe, maybe nobody here is having these struggles. Maybe none of the young people are having any of these pulls of the world. Maybe up here in Washington, the water washes it all away. But where I live, down in, down in the dry, arid desert, friends, we don't get a lot of water. We got a lot of problems. Nothing's getting washed away. The scripture says, whether therefore you eat, in other words, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatsoever you listen to, Whatever you watch, do everything you do to the glory of God. So we really need to ask the question, not what does Christian think, not what does distraction dilemmas think, not what does my pastor think. Yeah, it's good to listen to a multitude of counselors, don't get me wrong, but the counselor we should be going to and pointing everybody to is what glorifies God. It really doesn't matter what we want in a sense that God says, I don't want anything that's going to hurt you. And it can hurt you mentally and physically and neurologically and spiritually. And God says, look, it's not good for you. As much as I love my children, I never let Tyler drink arsenic. I just didn't say, now take a sip. We're going to build up your immunity. No. I say, don't drink it. But I want to. And I say, no. No. Why? It's going to kill you. You don't know that. Actually, I do. And what I'm saying to you today is some of the stuff we're playing with is going to kill us, spiritually speaking, and possibly physically. So what kind of music glorifies God? There are five criteria that a song must pass before we allow it into our Christian ears, and that's what we'll talk about right after the break. 